Usually when I start off a video, I try to think of some sort of hook. Perhaps it's an anecdote that'll help set the tone for the video. Maybe it's immediately presenting information I think is fascinating enough to grip a viewer before transitioning into the body of the video itself. Maybe it's even just doing something as simple as posing a question for the viewer to think about, such as if they should buy a certain game system in the current year. But the subject of today's video is so odd and obscure that I really didn't know how I was going to start off this video. That's why you're getting this spiel right now. These three games are the Mega Man MS-DOS Trilogy. Games licensed by Capcom in the early 1990s, but, well for two of them anyways, not published by them. Why do these games exist? Why are the initial two games debatably officially licensed fan games? And why is the DOS version of Mega Man X perhaps one of the best console to PC conversions of its time? Well, all of this and more will be answered in today's video. This is Stuff We Play, home of everything weird and retro. Today's showcase, the Mega Man DOS Trilogy. This is Mega Man 1 for MS-DOS. It comes on a single 3.5 inch floppy disk inside this big purple box, and I'm sure there's probably documentation and whatnot that came with it as well, but I don't have any of that. At present, all I own is this box and the floppy disk within. According to the front of said box, in this game you play as Mega Man as you, and I quote, match your metal against the mind of the evil Dr. Wily. And we are also informed here that, in order to play this title, you'll need a computer with at least a staggering 512k of RAM. As both a Mega Man game and as a PC game from 1990, admittedly this all just seems pretty standard. But things get weird as soon as we look at the back of the box. Upon flipping it over, we're treated with a blurb that begins, Break the death grip of the ultimate computer. As Mega Man, the robot Wonderkind created to save the world, match your metal against the mind of Dr. Wily, a megalomaniac with the hardware to match his ego. Two paragraphs later, confront Quark, a mega computer revved by the psychotic calculations of Wily's mad brain. Survive and challenge the mastermind behind the super brain, Dr. Wily himself. Now, along with that sounding like dialogue straight out of a 1950s Superman comic, this blurb makes Quark, this computer who's apparently an evil thing we're having to deal with, seem to be some sort of massive intelligence, a massively powerful supercomputer AI with potentially limitless knowledge and power. Did Dr. Wily truly create this machine, or is it a piece of ancient technology he revived, such as Raw Moon from Super Adventure Rockman? Eh, funnily enough, another Mega Man game that I've covered on this channel. Well, to be honest, I have no clue, because I don't have any additional documentation, and there's almost no in-game story. As far as I know, Quark isn't much of a threat, and is just a boss that appears and walks around, and that's pretty much it. What I also know is that, despite sharing a title of the original Mega Man game from 1987, this game has a completely different plot and completely different Robot Master bosses. Mega Man for DOS contains only three Robot Masters, the fewest of any dedicated Mega Man title. And honestly, the back of the box describes them way better than I ever could. Blow Sonic Man to splinters and grab his steel smashing Sonic Wave. Sizzle Voltman into a whining mass of wires and acquire his force field. Demolish Dynaman and gain his explosive nuclear detonator. And again, this all sounds very grandiose, but despite sharing a title with the original NES game, the box blurb and low quality screenshots make it very clear that this is a very different game. What makes things further weirder is the presence of Sparkman from Mega Man 3 for the NES below the blurb. Why they put him here is beyond me, especially as he never appears within the game itself. Actually, uh, uh, on that note, can we talk about how the actual box art is just a slightly cropped in and edited version of the box art from Mega Man Dr. Wily's Revenge for the Game Boy? The only major difference is the addition of Mega Man's robotic canine buddy Rush, who doesn't even appear in the game itself. Honestly, if it weren't for the presence of Capcom logos on the box, I'd likely have assumed that this was just a bootleg of some sort. But nope, it's real. 
and perhaps even crazier, it was made by just one guy. This one guy in question is one Steve Rosner, a man who, along with creating both Mega Man 1 and 3 on DOS, spent a large portion of his career in the video games industry working on sports titles for Electronic Arts. You may know him from such classic games as Madden 2004, Madden 2005, Madden 2006, and yes, even Madden 2007. But. Flashback to the late 1980s, and Rosner is getting his start as a young programmer, working on titles for the Commodore 64. One of his earliest works was a port of the original Street Fighter to the C64, which was more of a technical feat than a fun playable experience. And yes, this was pre-Street Fighter 2. You know, Street Fighter 1, that one game that nobody played. Anyways, this port of the game did well enough for Rosner to land a job at a company called Riggs International, where he worked on a title called Pocket Rockets. Riggs, however, was a very small company. According to a 2017 interview with PC Gamer, Rosner described the team as just being himself, an artist, and his boss. At some point in 1989, though, Riggs ended up being acquired by Capcom USA. While acquisition-related things were going on, Rosner decided that he was going to make a Mega Man game for DOS. And initially, it seems that he wasn't even intended for it to be an official thing. He was just doing this because he loved the series. But then, in the midst of working on this game, Rosner also decided to quit his job at Capcom and work elsewhere in the games industry. But the oddest thing is that, when he left, he also got Capcom USA to give his game their blessing, and they made an agreement allowing for it to be published on PCs as soon as he was done with it. And that's pretty much the creation story of Mega Man for MS-DOS. According to the aforementioned PC Gamer article, when asked what his process was for creating this game, Rosner just said, I just made whatever I wanted since I love the Mega Man NES game so much. And to be fair, I think that's actually a really admirable mindset to have going into a game like this. As we can see, it actually did get published. Why Rosner chose High Tech Expression specifically to publish it is beyond me. Maybe that was just Capcom's call. So I really need to stress that, though the origins of Mega Man for DOS are odd and crazy, I am not knocking Steve Rosner himself as a person. I'm sure he's a great guy and great at his work, and being ballsy enough to get your passion project published by a company is admirable, even if it's a company you already worked for and were in the process of leaving. And I really do need to stress that, that I do have some respect for Steve Rosner, because Mega Man for DOS itself has to be one of the worst games I've ever played. Like, this game is bad. Awful. Terrible. Atrocious. It's just plain not good. I'll say it again. I appreciate Steve Rosner's love for the series and his dedication to getting this game done. But this game is just an absolute slog from beginning to end, and even though it is possible to beat in under 20 minutes if you know what you're doing, there's few, if any, positive things that I can say about it. I mean, just look at Mega Man himself. Now look at his NES sprite. Now look at them together. Now look at the DOS sprite by itself again. Now look at this picture of the Pokemon Togepi. Now look at this Togepi figure I got for $2 at a shop in Chinatown. I rest my case. Just like the box it came in, Mega Man for DOS feels bootleg. It's only five levels long, but the first of those is really hardly a level. It involves you going through a gate and getting chased by a robotic guard dog, and don't even try to fight this thing. It can and will kill you with ease. Instead, just run past it, and within a few seconds of off-screening it, you'll be unceremoniously sent to the stage select screen. From there, we have our three Robot Masters. None of their stages are any fun, and none of their stages are unique or memorable enough to be worth discussing on their own. All three of these stages share common issues, though. There are enemies that are too small to be shootable by Mega Man, there are occasionally pixel-perfect jumps, and also, knockback from getting hit here will likely be your number one source of death. Thankfully, I'm also running my original floppy disk through a combination of a USB floppy drive and DOSBox on a more modern PC setup, meaning that I can map my controls here any way I please. And trust me, that's important. This mitigates the pain of playing this game just a bit because the intended control scheme is absolutely asinine. Like in a lot of PC platformers, you're supposed to use the arrow keys to move around and the spacebar to shoot. 
However, do you know what key you press to jump? That's right, the J key of course! This means that in order to play as intended, you need to use an awkward claw-like maneuver with your hands. Luckily for those masochistic enough to play this thing, like me, you can get around us by using a tool such as Joy to Key to just use a standard USB controller with this game. That makes a world of difference, even if the game itself is still dreadful. The boss fights here are also pretty underwhelming. Bosses can go down easily, and if you use any of the special weapons you obtain throughout the game against them, they'll go down in mere seconds. I think the absolute easiest of them is the final battle against Quark slash Dr. Wily. It's just an absolute joke, and you can beat it by barely moving at all. Perhaps the most baffling aspect of this game is the soundtrack, or rather, the lack thereof. Mega Man 4 DOS, despite coming from a series known for its great soundtracks, contains no music whatsoever. The only sounds present here are some very basic PC speaker sound effects, and that's it. Now, had this game come out in the mid-80s, this would have been excusable, but by 1990, PC sound cards were becoming more and more common by the day, making the omission of music outright just absolutely shocking. After about an hour of flailing around and suffering through a slew of cheap deaths and levels that range from mediocre to terrible, I finally beat this game. And what was my reward? Dr. Wiley has surrendered. Mega Man has saved the planet from destruction. But will it last? And yes, that's with exclamation points, not question marks. So I'm pretty sure that was meant to be a question. Anyways, spoiler alert, no. Peace will not last because only two years later, Mega Man for DOS would get a sequel, and that would be Mega Man 3 for DOS. And somehow, that game is even worse. So here's a fun fact about Mega Man 3 for DOS. It's really hard to find this one for a decent price nowadays. I spent literal months searching eBay and local retro game stores and thrift stores for this thing, and somehow every time I managed to come across it, the seller would want at least $50 or more for it. And as longtime viewers may know, I'm a bit of a cheap ass. Thankfully though, I recently found out that this game did get a single re-release. That's right, just one. As far as I can tell, Capcom would rather people forget about the Mega Man PC games, and I don't blame them. But in 1994, High Tech Expressions would release Street Fighter series for PC. This CD-ROM release contains DOS ports of Street Fighter 1 and 2, along with Mega Man 1 and 3 for DOS as quote-unquote bonus games. It's also a compilation that's virtually worthless, despite all the games contained on it being rather sought after by collectors, which made it my preferred way to experience Mega Man 3 for DOS for this video. I'm sure you have a few questions now. What are those Street Fighter games like? Is this a direct port of the NES version of Mega Man 3? And what happened to Mega Man 2 for DOS? Well, allow me to answer those as quickly and easily as I possibly can. The Street Fighter ports suck, this title pretty much has nothing to do with the NES game, and as for what happened to Mega Man 2 for DOS, well, there's actually a small bit of a story there. Following the release of Mega Man 1 for DOS, which apparently sold decently enough, Steve Rosner, now joined by his brother William, decided that they were going to make a completely new game, one featuring non-linear, maze-like levels and filled with messaging about protecting the environment. This would be the creatively titled Eco Man. This was very obviously going to be an attempt to ride off the wave of ecocentric media of the era, most notably the likes of Captain Planet. Anyways, it ends up that those high tech expressions didn't think that Eco Man was very good or had much potential to sell well. But they also made it clear to the Rosners that they would actually publish the game if they removed the environmentalist slant and redesigned it to look more Mega Man like. Thus, after getting the go-ahead from Capcom, that's exactly what the Rosners did. So, in 1992, the world was graced with Mega Man 3. The robots are revolting for MS-DOS. And by revolting, I assume that high-tech expressions meant that in the sense of the game being disgusting and not in terms of revolution. The reason that this title is called Mega Man 3 and not Mega Man 2 is because, and I kid you not, 
Of the six new Robot Masters created here, all of them are just slight alterations of designs of existing Robot Masters, with one resembling Sparkman from Mega Man 3. Sparkman also just so happens to appear in the box art for the NES Mega Man 3. And someone from Capcom suggested that if the Rosners just called their game Mega Man 3, they could just reuse the box art from the NES game! Speaking of those Robot Masters, in the years since this game's release, five of the six of them have seen counterparts in other Mega Man games, proving that the DOS games are completely non-canon. Wave Man would appear in Mega Man 5, which released for the NES that same year. Blade Man would later appear in Mega Man 10. Torch Man and Mega Man 11, Oil Man and Mega Man powered up for the PSP, and Shark Man would just be a net navi in the Mega Man Battle Network series. The only one of them not to appear in a different form in a different game is Bitman, unless you consider Bit from Mega Man X3 as an official counterpart to him. As for the stages themselves, they're they're all just awful. For some reason, there isn't an intro stage this time, and there still isn't any music. And the lack of music is especially a shame, as some of these stages took me upwards of 10 minutes. And that's not 10 minutes of platforming action, that's 10 minutes of wandering through and getting lost in maze-like stages. The worst of these are the multiple water levels, as unlike in the classic games where water causes Mega Man to just have an increased jump, in this game, he actually swims. And unlike in Mega Man 8 where that actually works, here his swim controls are just absolutely jank. Even though Mega Man 3 is running off of the same game engine as Mega Man 1 for DOS, it's very obvious that it was originally intended to be a different game. A lot of these stage themes don't even make sense. Why is Blade Man stage a water level? Why is Torch Man in a sewer? Honestly, the only one who makes sense is Oil Man, who, fittingly enough, is at an oil rig. But most shocking of all, once you beat the game, you get the exact same ending screen as in the first game. They didn't even bother to fix the misspelling of Dr. Wiley's name. While the first Mega Man game for DOS perhaps could be excused as a poorly executed fan project, Mega Man 3 is just peak laziness. I'm going to be honest, I would legitimately call this the worst game that I have ever played. I know I called Mega Man 1 for DOS all sorts of bad, and I know I've previously called Sonic 06 the worst game I've ever played, but at least while those are barely functional messes, they're memorable. Mega Man 3 for DOS is worse than a bad game. It's a boring game. The stages all run together. The game lacks an identity of its own. It added to the problems of the original instead of fixing them. And instead of being infuriated by all of this while playing, I instead found myself stopping myself from falling asleep. Look, I understand why High Tech Expressions made them reskin the game, because if this wasn't called Mega Man, I would have never touched it. The best analogy I can make is something like Sonic 06 is, is like watching The Room. Yes, it's terrible, but everyone needs to experience it at least once. Mega Man 3, on the other hand, is a special type of disappointing game. This one isn't even worth remembering. Look, I, I know that's an absolute downer, but thankfully there is another Mega Man game for DOS. Let's just hope it's a lot better. Okay, okay, despite what you just saw, this game didn't actually kill me. To be honest, Mega Man X for DOS is easily the best of these three games. And while I know that doesn't sound like much, it also has nothing to do with either of the high-tech expressions offerings, so I think I can hold it to a bit of a higher standard. This one was handled in-house by Capcom, and was released in 1995 on CD, two years after the original release of Mega Man X for the Super Nintendo. And why Capcom did this is pretty obvious. Mega Man X was massively popular, with the series already being up to Mega Man X3 by the end of 1995. Mega Man X for DOS would just be one of many, many re-releases of Mega Man X1 over the years. And unlike the two classic series DOS games, this one is pretty much just a straight port of the SNES game. And if you haven't played Mega Man X and or would like some context before continuing on with this video, then I'd recommend checking out that Trav Guys retrospective on it. So I mainly just want to touch on the five main differences that this version of Mega Man X has from the SNES version. So first off, this version of Mega Man X features a save system. 
For fans of the SNES version, this was probably a big deal at the time, as the original game required you to use a clunky old password system to save and resume your progress, assuming you didn't try to beat the game in one sitting. Now, this is a pretty standard quality of life update that's now found in pretty much every re-release of Mega Man X. But it's important to note that here, because this was the first version of the game to offer this feature. However, this somehow came at the cost of the riot armors that the Mega Man X series is known for. Despite X's rival Vile riding in on his iconic purple armor, X himself never gets a chance to ride one himself, despite those being really cool parts of the original game on SNES. It doesn't massively affect gameplay or anything, it's just kind of… weird. Also missing here is the secret Hadouken Fireball upgrade that you could get in the Armored Armadillo stage. After trying both the method for obtaining it in the SNES version and the method for obtaining it in Mega Man Maverick Hunter X for the PSP, I was unable to make the secret capsule show up here. And that's a shame. But despite those missing things, the game still plays incredibly well, with X still being really fast and fun and just a blast to play as. The only other big differences here come in terms of presentation. Visually, from a distance, this game looks nearly one-to-one -to, -one to the SNES version. The only big differences I noticed was, side-by-side, -side, the aspect ratio of the DOS game is slightly squished horizontally compared to the SNES version. But really, that's just a small detail that only die-hard fans will notice. The other major presentation difference is in the soundtrack. That's right, this game actually features a soundtrack. Huh, I never expected that to be something to write home about. Anyways, the compositions here are not nearly as good as the SNES version. You can actually hear one of the tracks in the background right now, and I I'd honestly rather not make you listen to it anymore, as these compositions just aren't great. I mean, don't get me wrong, they aren't awful, just not particularly good. There are definitely DOS games with much, much better soundtracks. Here, actually, let's switch to the SNES version of that track. Ah, oh, much better. But yeah, on the whole, Mega Man X for DOS is actually a good game. Of course, that's just because it's a straight-up port of one of the Mega Man series' most legendarily great titles, and it's a pretty decent port of said title. Of course, as Mega Man X itself has seen countless re-releases over the years, I can only recommend picking up this particular version of the game to the most diehard of diehard fans. But if you were gaming in 1995 and this was the only way you had to play the original Mega Man X, I think you'd be pretty happy with it. So with that, that's it for today's video on the Mega Man DOS trilogy. I actually promised to do this video a while back, and it took longer than expected. Which means that the moral of this story is I really shouldn't promise to do videos if I don't have a production schedule in mind. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this look at these odd titles. This was part 4 of an unofficial look I've been giving some of the weirder parts of the Mega Man series since last year. Over the course of this mini marathon thing, I've looked at Mega Man X6 with that Trav guy, Super Adventure Rockman, an incredibly odd Wonder Swan game, and now these DOS games. I definitely own more weird Mega Man stuff, such as this Mega Man 3 Tiger LCD game here. But for now, I think I want to turn my focus towards doing more hardware-focused content, along with covering even more games I consider to be weird and retro. Of course, none of this would be possible without viewers like you. Seriously, the support and video suggestions I get in the comments and on Twitter and Discord are part of why I enjoy doing YouTube so much. So with that said, I'd also like to quickly go ahead and thank some of my awesome patrons. Those are Justin Chipman, The Golden Bolt, Dylan Ola, and Robert and Abby Hornerbrook. They're all awesome, and their support means the world. But before I go, I'd also like to know, what's the worst PC game you've ever played? Let me know down in the comment section below. I try to make it a point of reading and responding to comments when I can, and I'm definitely curious to find out some of the terrible stuff you've ended up playing. So, with that, thank you very much for watching, stay classy, and I'll see you next time.